Im nächsten Video erklärt Tara Andrews die Möglichkeiten und Herausforderungen der Digital Humanities am Beispiel der Literaturgeschichte. Unser Verständnis von Literaturepochen orientiert sich an Klassikern, an einigen wenigen Werken, die aus verschiedensten Gründen einen sehr großen Bekanntheitsstatus erlangt haben. Durch Digitalisierungsprojekte wie Google Books und die digitale Bibliothek Hathi Trust haben wir nun Zugang zu Scans und Transkripten von Millionen von Büchern. Dieser gigantische Datenpool könnte ein völlig neues Verständnis von bestimmten Literaturepochen ermöglichen. Aber wer legt fest, welche Daten hierfür herangezogen werden? Und wer formt die Algorithmen, die wiederum unser Verständnis dieser Daten formen? What do you think of as a classic of literature? You might think of Shakespeare or Goethe or Mary Shelley. Some famous book by some famous author that you had to read in school. Now imagine that for whatever reason, you're at a party with well-read people or you're taking an English class, and the subject comes up of what 19th century British literature was like. You might think of George Eliot or Charles Dickens or the Bronte sisters, since these are some of the classics, the works that stood the test of time and are still taught today. But how well do they really represent 19th century British literature? Were the British people of the time really also cultured that they only read books that your English teachers would approve of? Of course not. There were a lot of things published and read back then that just didn't become famous. In fact, there was so much published that if you devoted yourself to reading a book a day for the rest of your life, you wouldn't get through it all, much less have time to draw any conclusions on the subject. You have to base your conclusions on the famous works, knowing all the time that the famous works are famous because they weren't normal. They were particularly great or particularly deep, and they resonated with people long after the 19th century. Given that, can we really say we understand 19th century British literature? Enter digital humanities. Specifically, let's think about all the digitization work that has been going on in the last years, such as the Google Books project or the Hathi Trust Digital Library. Now we have scans and even transcriptions of most of the literature produced in Britain in the 19th century. And we have computers and their limitless possibilities for writing algorithms and crunching data. Maybe now we have a way to start learning things about what 19th century British literature was really like. Some of the terms to describe what we can do include distant reading or reading machines. Now, we know that computers don't really read or understand language, even if they are starting to do a pretty scarily good imitation of it. So distant reading techniques involve asking questions that are a little bit different from the usual questions that your English professors might ask. We can pretty easily find out when particular words or phrases started being used and when they stopped being used. We can try to assign positive or negative sentiment scores. Positive would be happy, satisfied, laugh, content, and so on. Negative would be angry, rage, heartbreak, and things like that, and try to do sentiment analysis. Were authors writing happier things in 1855 than in 1845? Did women tend to write sadder stories than men? We can also try to look for topics by looking for groups of words that go together more often than you would expect on average. This is known as topic modeling and might say something about what people wanted to read about at different times or in different places. These ideas aren't limited to literature. There have also been some attempts at this sort of distant reading of history to see if we can identify larger trends that might tell us something about how and why things happened the way they did without resorting to the great man tendency of explaining everything as a result of what kings and emperors decided they wanted and pretending that no one else really mattered. For language and art and music, these big data methods of asking questions can also be very interesting for business. What if we can predict which book or which album will be the next bestseller? What if we can apply an algorithm to picking a likely Eurovision Song Contest winner? What if we can create a language model that can write all of our essays for us and all we have to do is tell it what the topic is? Please don't do that. So all this sounds like a great way of the future, right? After all, computer programs are much better than humans at counting words, at noticing details, at doing lots of fiddly computations, and we can trust that they aren't going to make a mistake in their math. But I bet some of you have already thought of where this all goes wrong. Yes, algorithms can be biased. Some of you will be thinking, oh yeah, I've totally heard of this, where job candidates with female names or black sounding names get discriminated against even when their CVs are exactly the same as those with names of white guys or where people with Hispanic names see advertisements for payday loan companies when they browse the web. 
others of you will be thinking, bias in algorithms, that doesn't make any sense. It's just math. There isn't any value judgment in 2 plus 2 equals 4. The algorithm's just calculating. It's a stupid computer. It can't discriminate. Both of these things are true. The algorithm, the computer program, only ever does what we humans tell it to with the data that we humans provide. And here's the key. If we tell the computer to add 2 and 2, we might need to ask ourselves, why did we tell it to add these particular numbers and not, for example, 3 and 7? That's to say, what kind of data is the computer working with and what kind of assumptions have we made about what needs to be calculated? This is the basic dilemma that we face when we start to turn our computer programs loose on piles of data that are so much bigger than what we can read and understand by ourselves, and why we have to be so careful that we aren't accidentally being naive. On the one hand, as we've seen in the previous videos in this unit, the computer is great for keeping us honest about what we are claiming and whether it makes sense given all the other things we are claiming. It's great for helping us keep track of who has claimed something so we can check their work too. But on the other hand, the computer only ever does what we tell it to. And we humans are perfectly capable of telling computers to do some pretty silly and even destructive things. Let's go back to some of our examples from the humanities. I talked about sentiment analysis, where we assign positive or negative values to words in order to look for positive or negative feelings from the text. Happy good, angry bad, right? But did we remember to look for negation? What about, I am not happy about this, or anger was the last thing on her mind? Even worse, what about irony or sarcasm? Well, that's a brilliant idea. What if the picture is intentionally contradicting the words? Or what if the message relies on some context that isn't part of the text we are an analyzing? Make America great again! If we aren't remembering to think about all the channels of how information gets communicated, then we can model up our conclusions pretty badly. Now think about our history project and our noble aim of understanding history as a big process full of lots of people and their dynamics, instead of a few powerful people running the whole show. We need a lot of data for this. Where is that data going to come from? Well, English Wikipedia has probably the biggest data collection out there about things that happened and people that lived. Let's use that. Oh, how odd. It seems that most of world history happened in ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, Western Europe, and the United States. And what happened in the Middle East or China is mostly to do with what was important in Western Europe. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? I hope you can actually see the problem here. We are missing a lot of information from a lot of perspectives of a lot of people who don't happen to have contributed to English Wikipedia. And this gap just serves to falsely reinforce Westerners' ideas of our own importance. The problems become even worse when industry gets involved. If we can predict what book, what album, what Eurovision song will be a winner, why would a studio or a publisher want to waste their time on losers? How many novel influences will we lose? How many Artistic innovations will never be noticed, and how boring will it be if those of us with more unusual tastes can't find any music we like? Even worse, if we believe the algorithm that someone wrote that tells us that someone with a Hispanic name is more likely to run out of money around payday, why would we give them a loan to start a business or buy a nice house? How are the people with Hispanic names ever to break out of these damaging stereotypes if our algorithms keep forcing them back in? This kind of predeterminism is so easy to find in the data we have, for so many of the wrong reasons. And one of the biggest challenges in today's society is how to make sure that we keep ourselves and each other accountable, to ensure that the openness and fairness that was supposed to come with all this endless data actually comes to be. I don't have any great answers that you can take away from this lesson. The main point is to make you aware of the problem. But this is also why I'm optimistic about where we can go from here. In the last several years, a lot of really smart people have been noticing these problems, and we're becoming better at spotting the sort of bias that does exist in the data we collect, and we're even becoming better in understanding how the bias got into the data. If we carry on thinking about responsibility, about accountability, about fairness and openness, then we have a great chance of actually building a better world with the data we can collect and create. You can consider this my invitation to you to take up exactly that challenge, to start thinking about where bias might be creeping into the systems around you and how you can help work against it.